which is the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. That's correct, yes. And we thank you for coming again. Thank you very much for asking me to be here. And thank you, sir. We appreciate your knowledge. And you have up to — you have up to eight minutes. It's going to be hard. I'm going to start by saying the most effective way of undermining or crippling the management of an immigration program is to allow a backlog to develop. And unfortunately, that's what happened when the 2001 Immigration Act was passed. It did not, for some strange reason, contain any mechanism for controlling the flow of immigrants. And the Act read, Section 11, paraphrasing, said that anyone who met the selection criteria shall be accepted. Of course, the Department should have realized that there are many, many thousands of people out in the world who can meet our selection criteria at any one time. And, of course, what happened is within months, a backlog began to build up. The government did attempt, I think it was in 2002, less than a year after the Act was in effect, to correct that by saying that all those in the backlog would have to meet now not — a higher level, a higher mark in the selection criteria. And that, of course, was ruled by the courts to be illegal and unlawful. And so nothing was done about the backlog until 2008, when by that time it had reached a million people waiting to come in. That's, you know, the province of Saskatchewan outside waiting to come to Canada. There has — there was an attempt in 2008, and it was moderately successful by the current — well, not the current minister, but the previous minister, Mr. Kenney, to control that to some degree by putting a cap on — well, first of all, changing the Act so that it meant that anyone, even though they met the selection criteria, may be accepted, not shall be. So there was no obligation to accept everybody who met the criteria. That was an important step, and it was difficult to get through. And, in fact, it had to be included in the budget to ensure that it would get through. At any rate, that was helpful. And later, as the minister said this morning, they did put a cap and have put a cap on the skilled worker component of the movement. And that, as Richard has mentioned, has been, again, quite successful. But the problem is there still remains many, many thousands, basically grandparents and parents, in the backlog. And one of the adverse results of having a massive backlog is that people who want to get here find other means of doing so. And that has resulted in what I consider to be one of the most serious implications of the backlog, and that is that it allowed the tremendous development of a temporary foreign worker program, something that we in Canada had always avoided, knowing what had happened to Europe in the 60s and 70s with the guest worker program. Thousands of guest workers came into Germany, France, and other countries of Europe, but, of course, they didn't go home. And they're there now and formed a big and large underclass in many of the European cities. It's a serious problem. We avoided that like the plague until the backlog developed. And employers who wanted and needed skilled workers found another route of getting them, and they got them as temporary foreign workers. Last year, there were 283,000 temporary foreign workers in Canada. Now, that figure, when you add it to the 280,000 immigrants that came in, is significantly large. On top of that, you have 250,000 foreign students, roughly, in Canada. And the foreign workers and probably a lot of the students are not going home. You can be sure of that. So that's the adverse impact, because many of the skilled, so-called skilled temporary workers are not so skilled. They don't have to meet any kind of requirements, basically. They don't have to meet education skills or education and training. Many of them are unskilled, the first to suffer if there's a layoff. I think that the problem here, really, is that if you look at it, that the current government has lost control of the immigration program. Of the 280-some thousand immigrants that came to Canada, only, I would guess, about, I don't know, 20 percent or less were selected or controlled by the federal government. I have figures here, but of the 280,000 that came in, 214,000 had nothing to do with the federal government except being checked for criminality and medical 
they were brought in uh, by employers, they were brought in by provinces, they were brought in by relatives, or they consisted of refugees and humanitarian cases and uh, several thousand live-in care workers or caregivers. So in effect, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the federal government has lost control of the movement. If you add that to the asylum system, where there's a backlog again of some 50,000 waiting, and again, even though they are found not to be genuine by the board, the chances are, are that they won't be sent home. So that, I think, is a serious problem. And until the backlog problem is resolved, uh, I don't think that any department or any minister is going to be able to manage the program effectively. Uh, how to solve it? Richard has given some solutions. Uh, my own view is that we have an obligation, a legal one as well as a moral one, to let the parents and grandparents in. I think it was a mistake to put the sponsored category in the act, as was done. Uh, normally, we, in the past, we only accepted parents if they were over the age of 60 and grandparents if they were over the age of 65. Opening up to parents of any age means we're getting a lot of parents who in, are in their 40s and 50s and who are entering the labor force. But that's beside the point. The current problem, I think, is until you get rid of the backlog, you're not going to be able to manage the immigration program effectively. And I would suggest that the way to do it is a variation of what Richard is suggesting, or bite the bullet and let the parents and grandparents in at the costs that that will uh, cost us in terms of health care and, and other things. Uh, thank you. Thank you uh, for both of you for your presentations. And uh, m members of the committee will have some questions. Mr. Menegadis.